Friends, good morning, and welcome to worship here at St. Andrews United Methodist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. As always, we are grateful that you have chosen to spend your time with us this morning. Um, we always begin our time together with some invitations and some updates. And just a worship update, we are grateful that we can gather online today. We will do so next Sunday. It's hard to believe it's already January 31st. And we will be making a decision this week about services of worship in February, especially as we look to begin Lent on Ash Wednesday, which is February 17th. So we'll let you know next week what our plans are, and you can also always check out the website as well as the chatter for updates and information. Um, a couple invitations. First of all, families, please be reminded that we continue with our winter vacation Bible school, Knights of North Castle. It will conclude next Sunday, but it's not too late to join. You can come at 3 o'clock today and next Sunday, or you can find us on YouTube so that you can choose a time which is more convenient for you and your family. I know the children and families that have participated have had a wonderful time, and we do encourage you to join and participate. There are a couple of other study opportunities. First, on Tuesday evening, if you want to dig deeper into Sunday's message, you can do so with a group of wonderful folks. You can reach out to Kevin Ward for more information there. Or on Thursday morning, Martha Murray is gathering people for a conversation utilizing Max Lucado's work, God is Always With You. So we trust both of those opportunities to um, your consideration. Also, please remember the family of Nell Slade as we gather here this coming Thursday, January 28th, for her memorial service on what would have been her 95th birthday. Again, please continue to remember her family and hold them in your prayers as they gather. And last but not least, the choir. The choir is looking for voices, both new and old to gather virtually beginning February 3rd so that they can put together um, some work and music as we move forward into Lent. And you're invited to check that out. Reach out to Sarah Terrell for information. So again, friends, we're glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. And as we continue together, I offer you these words. Oh Lord, let our souls rise up to meet you as the day rises up to meet the sun.
Friends, this morning, our welcome and call to worship is taken from liturgy in the Northumbria community. Hear these words. One thing I have asked of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Who is it that we seek? We seek the Lord our God. Do you seek him with all your heart? Church, say with me, amen, Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your soul? Amen, Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your mind? Amen, Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your strength? Amen, Christ, have mercy. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Gather for my good. And 
La paz, la paz de Cristo esté contigo, contigo, contigo y con todos sus seres. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Que Dios los bendiga. Good morning, everyone. I've been doing a lot of thinking since we have a brand new year. And I want to work hard at putting Jesus at the center of my life more and more. Because, you know, sometimes since I've been home more, you kind of get lazy and maybe don't keep the same routine and habits. Well, sometimes I just don't wake up thinking about Jesus first. And I want to do that. And I think that's one of my goals for 2021 is to think about Jesus first. Well, this made me think about, this is kind of how I feel. If this jar is me, I tend to put Jesus last. Put him on top of everything else that I fill my life with. So I thought, well, how do I get Jesus first and at the center? I can't seem to push him in when I don't put him first. So the best way to do it is to start fresh. You know, start the new year off. Let's dump everything out that's a part of my life and put Jesus first. Then I'll add everything back in and let all the pieces get around around Jesus. My time with prayer, my time with Bible study, my time with my family, all these things in my life, but uh-oh, there are a few things that don't seem to fit back anymore. But that's what happens when you put Jesus first. When he's first and at the center of your life, everything else fills in around, and the things you need are filling in spaces in your life. And you become complete a lot sooner. The things we don't need, maybe video games or times watching football instead of praying or reading my Bible. Or maybe it's just time being lazy, not doing anything for anybody else. Whatever those things are in your life, maybe we need to get rid of those things and let Jesus take away the parts that we don't need to fill our lives with. Maybe our challenge should be to always put Jesus first and start with him and let him fill our lives up and then let the things that are important to us surround us. That's going to be part of my goal for this year. Maybe you'll join me and think about what you need to do to put Jesus first in your life and maybe what you need to give up to make sure Jesus stays first in your life. Let's have a prayer. My life is so full, God, 
that sometimes I'm just not sure which way I'm running. Guide my steps. I pray today that you will help me keep Jesus first and then let me fill in with friends, family, church, serving others, and let my world be complete because of Jesus. Amen. Well, who knows? Maybe I can go cook some dinner now. Dear friends, queridos amigos, let's pray. Oremos. Mighty God, how great is your perfection that surrounds us in all your creation. Poderoso Dios, cuán grande es tu perfección que nos rodea en toda tu creación. Heavens, earth, sea, rivers, waterfalls, meadows, mountains, and forests proclaim your greatness and power. Cielos, tierra, mar, ríos, cataratas, praderas, montañas y bosques proclaman tu grandeza y poder. We enjoy being a part of your making, created in your image and likeness. Nos gozamos en ser parte de tus hechos creados a tu imagen y semejanza. Today we pray for St. Andrew's family, for encouragement and lifting for the discouraged, for comfort for the afflicted and sad, for the healing of the sick of all illnesses. Oramos por la familia San Andrew's, por aliento y elevación para los desanimados, por consuelo para los afligidos y tristes para la curación de sus enfermos de toda índole. We pray for our staff, for all members of, for their enthusiasm and dedication in doing their best to meet the challenges of our congregation. Oramos por los funcionarios y todos los miembros por su entusiasmo y dedicación en hacer mejor para atender a los desafíos de nuestra comunidad. We pray for the members of the church council so that their dedication and commitment can be the difference in our beautiful congregation. Oramos por los miembros del concilio de la iglesia para que su dedicación y compromiso pueda ser la diferencia en nuestra linda congregación. We pray for LHCC teachers and volunteers, loves and fishes, Dahlia Grove, in St. Andrew's Preschool, who impact lives in our community. Oramos por los maestros y voluntarios del LHCC, por panes y peces, Dahlia Grove, y el preescolar de San Andrews, que impactan nuestras vidas en la comunidad. We cry out for the unity of the country. Anoint our leaders with wisdom and grace. Clamamos por la unidad del país. Unge nuestros líderes con sabiduría y gracia. We are happy to be part of this great country where we live with different types of immigrants from all ethnic groups in the world. Nos alegramos por ser parte de este país donde convivimos con diferentes inmigrantes de todas partes de etnias del mundo. We pray for the new president and his entire team who has just assumed leadership of our country. Oramos por el nuevo presidente y todo su equipo que acaba de asumir el liderazgo de nuestro país. Lord, you see where we have been defeated and where we have failed you. And so you still love and have plans and purposes for us. Señor, tú ves donde hemos sido derrotados y donde hemos fallado. Y así nos amas y todavía tienes planes y propósito para nosotros. For all the things, we are happy to remember the prayer you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is found in the epistle of Apostle Paul to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. According to the New Living Translation, we read the word of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one and another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and tried a criminal's death on the cross. 
La lección de la escritura de hoy se encuentra en la epístola del apóstol Pablo a los filipenses, capítulo 2, versículos 1 al 8, según la nueva traducción viviente. La palabra de Dios se lee en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. ¿Hay algún estímulo en pertenecer a Cristo? ¿Existe algún consuelo en su amor? ¿Tenemos en conjunto alguna comunión en el Espíritu? ¿Tienen ustedes un corazón tierno y compasivo? Entonces háganme verdaderamente feliz, poniéndose de acuerdo de todo corazón entre ustedes, amándose unos a otros y trabajando juntos con un mismo pensamiento y un mismo propósito. No sean egoístas, no traten de impresionar a nadie, sean humildes, es decir, considerando a los demás como mejores que ustedes. No se ocupen solo de sus propios intereses, sino también procuren interesarse en los demás. Tengan la misma actitud que tuvo Cristo Jesús. Aunque era Dios, no consideró que el ser igual a Dios fuera algo a lo cual aferrarse. En cambio, renunció a sus privilegios divinos, adoptó la humilde posición de un esclavo y nació como un ser humano. Cuando apareció en forma de hombre, se humilló a sí mismo en obediencia a Dios y murió en una cruz como morían los criminales. Esta es la palabra de Dios para el pueblo de Dios. Gracias, Señor. Friends, will you pray with me and for me? Gracious, holy, and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all those gathered said, Amen. Friends, I begin this morning offering you words from Kathleen Norris. In the suspicious atmosphere of the contemporary Christian church, it is good to know one's ground. And with that statement, Jim Harnish begins the work, Journey to the Center of the Faith, that will provide the focus from which we will draw our conversations in the coming weeks. And if you're interested in going deeper, well, as was shared with you earlier in the service, then tune into Tuesday Night Bible Study. You can reach out to Kevin Ward for more information about that opportunity. If you are not new to the faith, the topics that we cover will probably sound familiar. Being Christ-centered, biblically rooted, and kingdom-visioned. We'll explore what it means to be grace-filled, soul-strengthened, and community-connected. And if you are new to the faith, Well, we are glad that you have chosen to enter into this time with us, and we look forward to the way that these stories will inform and transform all of us. As Harnish begins his work, he offers the story of his seventh grade science professor who perched a gyroscope on the edge of his old wooden desk. And friends, I really did try to find a gyroscope so that I could have like an online like sermon example, but I wasn't able to lay hold of one. So if you need to Google it, you can, but you know, well, never mind. Just look up gyroscope. The seventh grade science professor perched his gyroscope on, on the edge of the old wooden desk and it didn't move. His teacher told him, he told the class, that it keeps, that the gyroscope keeps its precarious balance because the axis does not move. Keep the stable center, he said, and it will balance on anything. Lose that center, however, and well, you get the picture. It not only falls over, but it completely falls off. And maybe, maybe in thinking about it, that's what has drawn me to the series. For it seems, friends, that we are living in a world where the center has slipped, and we increasingly find ourselves at the extremes. And like the gyroscope, it seems that we have lost our balance, and in some cases, we have just tipped over the edge. So my hope is, is that maybe, just maybe, over the coming weeks, we can take this journey together and, and find our way back to the center, the via media, as Wesley described it, and reclaim the story for ourselves and for others. In looking at today's lesson in chapter one, Harnish begins with this quote from Henry Nouwen. 
Nowen wrote, in every phase of my search, I have discovered that Jesus Christ stands at the center of my seeking. If you were to ask me, what does it mean to live? I would have to reply, living with Jesus at the center. Harnish writes, as a local church pastor, and I could really resonate with what he says here, I spend a great amount of energy oiling the machinery that makes the institutional church run. But the answer to the deepest hungers of our souls are not found in organizational systems or structures. He writes that he has invested his life in the study of Christian theology. But the gravitational center of the Christian life is not a unanimous assent to a body of intellectually comprehended beliefs. I am concerned, he writes, about the moral and social values of this nation, but the Christian faith is not defined by a specific political party or agenda. I am grateful for the church that nurtured my faith, ordained me in the ministry, and appointed me to serve. But the stabilizing center for my soul is not my denominational identity. The only clearly defined center for the Christian life is the love, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Friends, let me say that for you one more time. The only clearly defined center for the Christian life is the love, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Harnish's words echo the ancient hymn of the church which we heard earlier in the service. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. In short, friends, I would suggest that we are all in need of an anchor and a sail, and how grateful I am that Jesus is both for me. So if Jesus is at the center of our journey, and we are journeying towards the center, where, where do we begin? Well, I encourage you in the coming weeks to dust off your Bible or pull out your smartphone or tablet and look up version or, or Bible Gateway and pick one of the Gospels. I'd recommend Mark because that is the season in which we find ourselves. Choose the translation with which you connect and read. Just simply read. Read the story. For as Harnish describes... We begin the process of transformation by simply seeing Jesus as he is portrayed in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as you read, I trust that you will be challenged, be inspired, be confused, be convicted, be encouraged, be saddened, be emboldened, be strengthened, be uplifted, be surprised. And yes, I would suggest that even if you are steeped in the faith, you will find something new that you have never noticed before. And when you've read it, find someone else to talk with about this Jesus and see where they have been challenged, inspired, confused, convicted, encouraged, saddened. Well, you, you get the point. And then find other people to talk to. For you see, that's what this season of Epiphany is about. The season of Epiphany is the reminder that the good news of Jesus, the evangel, the gospel, has become clear. And we learn again that it is made available to everyone, not just a chosen few. And friends, as you're engaging in this, see what happens. Because friends, something will happen. Because reading about Jesus tends to lead to invitation to shift from knowing about to well, knowing. As Harnish writes, knowing Jesus involves moving beyond mere information and choosing to live in spiritual solidarity with him. Consider this prayer of Mother Teresa. Dear Jesus, help us to spread your fragrance everywhere we go. Flood our souls with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess our whole being so utterly that our lives may only be a radiance of yours. 
shine through us and be so in us that every soul we come in contact with may feel your presence in our soul. Let them look up and see no longer us, but only Jesus. For in the act of reading about Jesus, we can begin to see ourselves and claim his acts as our own and embody them teaching and journeying and feeding and welcoming and challenging and being challenged and gathering children and questioning the powers and principalities and discipling others for a future not our own. But friends, there is a caveat. Be aware or maybe beware that choosing to journey with Jesus is not without cost. Because ultimately, as Harnish reminds us, is that Jesus will take us to the place of claiming him so fully that we have to let go of self. Nothing that has not died will be resurrected. To live in solidarity with Jesus, we must go to the place where he surrendered the power and control of his life in obedience to the self-giving love of God. And it is in the cross, it is in the cross that we find the center. For the journey begins with and takes us to the cross, love of God, of love of neighbor. And that is not only our destination, but the source of all that we do. As he concludes this chapter, Harnish asks several questions that I believe may be helpful to us today and in the coming weeks. He asks, what difference would it make for you to go, to move from knowing about Jesus to living in solidarity with him? What changes would this bring or require in your life? And consider for a moment what is at the center of your life? Harnish is a good Christian educator at this point, and, and he invites you to take a sheet of paper and to draw a set of concentric circles. And if you don't know what that is, it's a set of circles of different sizes around a common center. And if you don't know what that is, draw a dot and then just draw circles that keep getting larger and larger and larger from the center. And note the significant relationships and commitments of your life. What does that drawing tell you about what or who is at the center? For Harnish shares, when confronted with confusion and uncertainty, I find myself asking, does it look like Jesus? Do my lifestyle, my attitudes, my relationships, my values, and my convictions reflect the compassion, joy, and wholeness of Jesus? Most important of all, am I being drawn more deeply into the central core of cross-shaped, Christ-like obedience? Is my life centered in an all-consuming love of God and other people? He also asks, have you found a place in your experience where the Jesus of history has become the Christ of experience? Has the, the Jesus about whom you have read become a living presence with whom you share your life? Friends, my hope and prayer for each of us is that that is a part of the role that the church plays in our lives and that we play in each other's lives. For as the former theologian J. Ellsworth Callas suggested, Jesus is the pattern and the power, the model and the source of authentic human life. We are meant to have what he had and has, a radical and liberating faith in God, a childlike trust in the grace of God, a trembling wonder before the mystery of life, a durable hope that because we are in God's hands, death and sorrow and pain and tears are not the end, but joy and wholeness and laughter are. An undimmed awareness that the heart of all things is unconditional and compassionate love and 
an astonishing confidence that we in the world are headed not toward midnight, but toward sunrise. Friends, those words of callous echo, I believe, what we heard this week during the inauguration from Amanda Gorman, the National Youth Poet Laureate and the, and the youngest inaugural poet at age 22. And this is excerpted from her poem, The Hill We Climb. When day comes, she writes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? But one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. To that, I simply say, from her lips to God's ears, and I pray that we may do the work and explore where we are in this journey. And may we journey together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's children said, Amen. Thankful for this time of worship, we now have the opportunity to respond to the word read, sung, and proclaimed by pausing to consider the abundance God has provided for us. It is fitting for us to return a portion of God's gifts with our tithes, offerings, our service, and our witness. Let us pray. Oh dear Lord and Heavenly Father, in this time of turmoil surrounding us, a pandemic, political and civil unrest, and an ever-changing world. We are so thankful for St. Andrews and our wonderful staff, and for your continued presence with us. Please accept our tithes and offerings, and in so doing, give us the desire and the courage to have the mind of Jesus, to share his love with others in a hurting world, wherever we are and wherever we go. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.
Friends, as we part from one another this day, I thank you again for the opportunity to join together and to worship with one another. This prayer that I send you forth with is taken from the Common Prayer, a liturgy for ordinary radicals. It is a Celtic benediction. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you. Wherever he may send you, may he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonder he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Friends, go in peace to serve the Lord and love your neighbor. May we find opportunity again and again to keep Christ at the center of all that we do. Amen.